child, I can say that it's poor. Uh, we are poor. I met a foreigner. He was saying that I can take care of you and I can give you a better life. I was 14 years old. I was working in a, a bar. Uh, he asked me, do you want to work at spa? I answered yes because we have nothing to eat. And I didn't really know that you will go with that customers and have sex. She was recruiting us to take nudes from us. And then she will have money from the foreigner. I told the manager, I'm just 15. And then I was forced to do some things because of money. But then as time goes by, he introduces me to a cyber sex wherein I sit in front of the camera and he would ask me to do stuff while someone is on the computer. My mother, she wants to see what kind of job. Then she noticed that I'm pregnant. And then in the... Then as time goes by, the foreigner guy said he would post my pictures all over Facebook, on social media, if I don't have actual sex with some strangers that I don't even know. I was 21 with my one-year-old boy, pregnant with this foreigner's child and it really gave me an, an awakening message that, hey, it's a baby girl, it's a girl. Do you want this to happen to her? So it's like, it stick to my mind that, no, I, I know how hard it is to have this kind of life and I don't want her to go through. Like, that, that's it. I, I don't want my children to experience what I experience. And, I don't want them to, I don't want them to witness how my life is. I, I want, I just want to have a better life. It was in the middle of the night. The foreigners sleep where I pack my things with my baby and already pregnant. And um, we were in the middle of the streets, carrying my luggage. I went to a friend. I asked, I asked her if I could stay there just for a few days. And they took me to the shelter. Like any other Sunday, I go to church uh, together with my family. We sit in the same spot, blissfully unaware that it's the start of a sequence of events that would change my family's life and, and the lives of the people that uh, we employ now. The church was doing a sermon series on social justice. And as part of that, they invited um, different guest speakers uh, to share uh, their work. And, and one of those was around rescuing women from from sex trafficking. 
What captured me was a deep appreciation of where God stands in terms of justice. How he roars out when there is injustice. And he compels us to feel the pain that he's feeling and to do something about it. Philippines is the global epicenter for online sexual exploitation. And that's because of two main factors. One is access to, you know, cheap internet. Uh, and the other is the, the, the ability of the population to speak English so that it's easier for them to find foreign customers. And after meeting some of the organisations involved in rescuing victims of trafficking, and we soon realised that some of the aftercare components were quite lacking, particularly in regard to sustained, decent employment. It seemed a bit convenient that uh, once you rescue, it's mission accomplished and everything else will fall into place. I knew that one of the greatest needs that they would have would be um, a stable and well-paid job. The vision, therefore, was to develop highly skilled professionals from the survivor population. I'm a family physician and I also have a Master of Public Health. So my work involves both clinical practice and program development and management. I was working in Deutsche Bank in the global technology and operations area. So I had been thinking about computer-based work. So a digital media outsourcing service catering to clients all over the world. And we provide long-term digital careers in a workplace designed specifically for survivors of trafficking and abuse. Perhaps we wouldn't have done it if we knew how hard it was going to be. And as hard as it has been and some of the pain that we've carried, it doesn't compare in any way to what they've experienced uh, and the ongoing struggles that they still have. After it was dark, Nightmares. I stayed in that shelter for a year. And as soon as I get out of the shelter, they invited me for an interview. The intent from the very start was to work with NGOs and those who are operating shelters. They're providing basic housing, sanitation, education. But at a certain point, it needs to translate to work. And that's where we come in. Most of the people that we employ day one, they have very basic literacy, numeracy. Honestly, at that time, I have no idea what is Microsoft, what is Excel. And then they interviewed me. I don't know even a computer. But in my mind, they're gonna train me anyway, so I just, yeah, I know Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Word, and PowerPoint. The first five weeks is intense, and within a short period of time, through our training program, take them to a point where they're editing photos. Nexter Photos is the main client. They do the shoots in the U.S., uploading these photos into our delivery service. We deliver around 4,000 edited photos daily, making sure that there are no flash shadows, no reflection of the photographer. Everything's properly aligned. There would be sky replacements, depending on the client's preference, and the professional quality of the work, and being excellent, just pursuing excellence in the things that you do. That's one of the principles that our employees pick up from Nextor Photos. Before, I thought that I'm dumb. But now, I feel proud of myself that I can do this. It's not a usual supplier-customer type relationship. There's, there's an underlying depth to that, which is the social impact. And that social impact is conveyed through the metrics that we provide but also when next door photo employees speak to our team and experience firsthand uh, change in the lives of our employees, that makes a profound difference.
it's not just like we provide a job and there's it's all good and it's a happily ever after. When we provide a job and a, an income, there is a resurgence of the pressures and, and some of the um, dynamics that led to trafficking in the first place, such as abuse at home, alcoholism or mental health issues, or family members that will come back into their lives and want money. There's an enormous amount of financial pressure that they have to deal with when they start working. So we have the business, and alongside that, I have a small foundation called Unusia. So my team and I provide support and services into the workplace to help the employees be successful here and also in their personal lives. And so we are trying to create a predictable workplace so that when they come in, they can relax. So things like the relaxation exercise, we've scripted and sort of institutionalised that. It's time for the five-minute relaxation exercise. In our data, we see that 40% come with still active PTSD symptoms and many also have just general anxiety and depression when they enter the workplace. Trauma damages the ability to focus, pay attention. And the work here requires a lot of sustained attention and focus on detail. Start to wiggle both your fingers and your toes. Open up your eyes and close your eyes. Relax your face and your neck. And we feel like the actual work itself repairs some of the the damage done to their brain or their cognitive processes. So it's like a form of prolonged exposure therapy in many ways. We, we expose them to incremental levels of stress whilst providing them the skills to manage that stress by using formalised training programs and then also workplace counselling and also nursing care. We're not just trying to prevent the manifestations of trauma, we're trying to create an environment where they, they recover. And my increasing belief is that, you know, the workplace can and perhaps even should be the major site for recovery and reintegration. I want my children to be proud of me. I just have to grab the chances that were given to me and take it. So they come from a situation where they feel that there's no hope and there's not much to look forward to. But despite that, they take that first brave step to apply to this company and then we walk this journey together. So we can decide for ourselves what successful recovery and reintegration looks like, but ultimately they are going to be the experts in their own journey. The first goal that I put in my mind is that one year from now, I will, I will be promoted. After one year, I na kay going sa la in the stage sa kwan sa Although those challenges, um, those memories, it's still in me because it's, it's part of my life. But I don't lose hope. I am happy with what I am now. Good afternoon, everyone. We are all here today to celebrate our sixth year anniversary. Let me call in Sir Sam.
Six years ago, Mindy and I could not have foreseen all of the problems, the heartaches, the stress and the challenges, right? But we could not also foresee the joy, the triumphs, the wins, and you. Each one of you have an incredible story inside of you. You see an individual that's scared and afraid, and you invite them to come into the company. And you see all of the systems and workplace structures and culture that we created. But at the end of the day, you can see them sitting at their desk, having a good chat with one of their co-workers or team leaders and smiling and laughing. And you know that they're doing better than where they were at the start. And to me, that makes it all worthwhile. I didn't get any salary in the spa. But now I have my salary, I have my benefits. I just feel family here. I really see God in this working place. We know each other's stories like family because of this job. It's just, I feel God in me. And in fact, realize how important my life is, like how valuable I am. Wow.